Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which we've been hosting for more than 13 years around the world, the next of which we're hosting September 12th to the 14th here in our home city of New York at the Javits Center Expansion. Uh, but our goal at those events and our goal on these talks is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. If you've been a frequent listener here on SALT Talks, you know that one of those big ideas that we like to cover is the growth of the digital assets industry. And we're very excited today to bring you the latest episode of the SALT Crypto Show. Our guest today is David Mercer, who is the Chief Executive Officer of LMAX Group. And a reminder that the SALT Crypto Show is brought to you by our partner, FTX. Again, David Mercer is the CEO of LMAX Group, which is the leading operator of institutional FX and cryptocurrency execution venues. Following a successful management buyout, David has built LMAX Group into a key player in both the traditional capital markets and the crypto trading industry. Headquartered in the UK, the group operates six exchanges globally and trades in excess of $25 billion a day. In 2021, LMAX Group sold a minority stake to private equity firm JC Flowers & Co. Hosting today's talk is Anthony Scaramucci, who's the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, which is a multi-billion dollar global alternative investment firm that several years ago started investing heavily into the digital asset space. Anthony is also the chairman of SALT, and with that, I'll turn it over to him to begin the interview. David, we're, we're thrilled to have you back on SALT Talks. Uh, you built an amazing company, uh, and you were one of the leaders in the cryptocurrency digital asset space. It was about 12 months ago, almost exactly. I was looking at my calendar, almost exactly 12 months ago, you and I on SALT Talks. Uh, at that time, the marketplace was on the rise. Uh, there was an expectation of rapid institutional adoption, um, and then things changed. So what do you think happened exactly, and where do you think we are right now? Well, good to be here. Good to see you again, Anthony. Um, you know, look, what a difference a year makes. I'm not sure, you know, I'll be absolutely frank with you. I'm not sure this rapid institutional adoption was ever fact. And you know this, it was more about press inches than what we were seeing in committee inches, right? I.e. committees within the banks and the institutions. Because that's exactly what they do. They move forward, you know, that famous Al Pacino style in inches. So it was never going to be rapid adoption. I think as Bitcoin particularly and crypto generally was on the rise, was a little bit more, a little bit more of velocity behind it. There was people thinking there was that fear of missing out. So certainly, there was more committee meetings. So there was more. There was maybe the occasional more inch, uh, more inches happening. But actually, what I'm seeing from the serious institutions, from the banks, is that despite the collapse in the asset price, despite uh, a few well publicized bankruptcies and failures of stable coins, those institutions are still progressing inch by inch. So I think the adoption's happening. It's not as rapid as people talked about. Um, it's not as rapid as probably I would hope for. But actually, I look at this as it's not that dissimilar to dot com. You know, everyone's looking at the time, okay, what's our what's our uh, E-commerce strategy, for example. It didn't disappear because of .com. The, the big guys just knew that's, that was inevitable. And they kept trucking along with that strategy, that plan. For me, it's the same with crypto today, right? But I guess everyone's bought themselves a little more time, you know, including ourselves, including yourself. Everyone's bought more time to think about it, maybe assess the risks out there. But I think it's undeniable certainly that Bitcoin is here to stay. And it's undeniable that crypto will form a, a part of people's portfolios going forward. So the adoption 
may not be rapid, but a bit like technology, I think it's going to be much bigger than anyone can imagine 20 years from now, but it may not be as quick or as big as you expect two years from now. So what, so other than inertia, institutional caution, uh, the, pr- the trade press and the generic mainstream press being negative on cryptocurrency, um, you know, I, I was uh, I was profiled in a rag le- two weeks ago on the SS Mooch where I had a ton of Bitcoin on the boat and I'm sinking as I'm, as the boat's going down. And of course, that was the bo- the near term bottom. I think they wrote that article about me when Bitcoin was at eighteen thousand. Um, but other than those things, which you and I both know about and we can deal with because we're entrepreneurs. We've also seen another movie taking place, okay? And you and I know this. We're experienced guys. There are no new mistakes. We, it was almost like Bernie Madoff got married to John Merriweather, and they gave birth to three Arabs, right? So you got not only, the, not only did you get the Ponzi scheme, but you got the fraud and the leverage combined in the Ponzi scheme. So we know that there's no new mistakes, but do you think that has crippled us? Do you think that that's where that's now behind us and that won't happen again? What's your attitude about what's taken place over the last three months in terms of the disappearance of Terra Luna, Three Arrows, Voyager, Celsius? I mean, I can go on and on, but tell me what you think. Yes. So they're all different things, right? Um, I look at, and it's quite easy, there's a lot of people out there that are happy to, to, to dance on graves, that, that are happy to say, I told you so. To be honest with you, I didn't hear many people telling me I told you so, right? Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, people calling it after the fact now and you know, dismissing people with tattoos and the likes of things. But look, let's face it, Terra Luna is a scientific experiment, a new, ver- a new version of a stable coin. Um, it didn't work. There's a hell of a lot of these scientific experiments aren't going to work. I believe only from the press that there's 19,000 unregistered securities out there, if you, if you follow Mr. Gensler's uh, rhetoric, but tokens of some sort. Now, there's no way they're all going to work. They can't work. They can't exist. Because even if you imagine, uh, if, if you imagine uh, an environment where crypto is, is $10 trillion, well, it's just not a $10 trillion doesn't, doesn't get divided by 19,000 and end up with something which is a valuable asset. You know, crypto, Bitcoin today is probably worth about half a trillion. So that doesn't work. A lot of these experiments aren't going to work. Now, people can talk about um, the characters of those individuals. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I just know that scientific experiment didn't work. And some people got burnt. That's the nature of capital markets, right? We've all made investments that didn't work out. And that's going to continue. Then we look at the Three Arrows example and other, so, you know, other companies are going to liquidation. You know, it's the old, did everyone understand credit risk? You know, did they analyze it properly? Um, did everyone understand leverage correctly? Um, so look, you know what? That's going to happen again. It's happened for as long as you and I have been in capital markets. So... And I don't look at those. I don't look at those individuals. I can't comment on those individuals. I just know that it's going to happen again. In the whole scheme of crypto, these aren't big numbers. In the whole scheme of traditional capital markets, these aren't big numbers. Now, remember, what's the point of crypto? Which part? What part is it trying to play? I say this time and again. Traditional finance. There are two hundred trillion dollars of of assets in custody today. Total value of crypto today, less than a trillion. Okay, at its height, it was up around two or three trillion. This is small. So all these collapses you talk about, you know, look at the big numbers if, if you happen to be the loser there. But in terms of traditional finance, they are barely a ripple on the ocean of investment out there and the, and the ocean of investment of which uh, crypto aims to play in going forward. So I think... There's nothing, for me there, there was nothing systemic in there. A couple of examples. A stable coin that didn't work. A company that was a hedge fund, so-called, that was over leveraged and had, you know, some risk parameters that didn't seem seem well assessed. 
and then of course the lenders to to that fund. But I mean, nothing systemic. When I look at Bitcoin, you know, where did Bitcoin trade? I haven't got a chart in front of me. Where did it trade at the start of the pandemic? I'm going to call it at less than 4,000, 3,800 roughly. Where's it trading today? 25,000. Well, that's a pretty good performing asset when I look at all the other assets around the world. Now, an asset that's dropped 50% this year, 60% from its high. Yeah. Amazon traded at 111 and down to seven in the 2000 dot com crash. Didn't make it a bad company. And I think Bitcoin, having been around for 14 years, has proven itself. It's, it's very robust. So for me, nothing's changed and nothing systemic, is out, uh, systemic has changed. Uh, and I think crypto and certainly Bitcoin is on the road to being a few percentage points, for sure, of all the assets uh, under management and in custody within the next three to five years. And that hasn't changed over the last 12 months. So let me... Let me switch gears because I obviously you and I are in agreement on this and we see it the same way. But let me switch gears. I think something seminal happened and I want to get your reaction to it or your opinion. Maybe you think it's seminal or maybe you don't think it's seminal. Uh, Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, uh, two things happened in the last month. He teamed up with Coinbase on their Aladdin risk management product and he announced a public trust where he's going to offer out a trust security to people where they can get exposure to Bitcoin through BlackRock. Or is that a seminal moment or is that just a blip? What, what's your opinion? Um, it's not a blip. It's back, back to those inches again. You know, they've, I think there was something quoted maybe four or five years ago from Larry, if he wasn't convinced. Let's just call him a crypto skeptic at that time. Something's happened that's uh, convinced him and um, convinced the, his company to change tax. So I think certainly not a blip. It's the start of something. Not everyone's announced it, but a lot of people are looking at, at similar strategies. I know because from the banking side, we have 35 banks trading foreign exchange with us day in, day out. And I would tell you right now that 15 of them are inching along with their strategies and, and that hasn't changed. So, yeah, look, I, I think if I, was, uh, if I was trying to chart the growth of this, it could be a seminal moment. It, it could be. But I think there's many of them. You know, the Fidelity announcement, uh, the BlackRock announcement, there'll be more to come. For me, the seminal moment will be when ABC Bank says, hey, we're offering the spot and the futures product to all of our customers from this state onwards. And by the way, we are going to be custodians of Bitcoin. For me, that's going to be the moment, the tipping point. But this is it. Look, this is definitely a good thing. If nothing else, I think it's fabulous that the world's largest uh, asset manager is providing access to this, new, uh, to this new asset class to their client base. And it's sort of secure market access, which always makes capital markets endure, right, and gives people confidence. So I think, I think that's great. I couldn't tell you whether this is the tipping point specifically or not. Well, I, I like it. Let me ask you another, just a little bit of hypothetical. What about a cash ETF in the United States? Would that be a seminal moment? Could be. I mean, honestly, I'm, to be honest, Anthony, I don't really have a, I don't have a view on that. But look, th those products themselves have become a lot more popular over the past decade. So again, I think ease of access. I'm going to come back to this time and again. It's all about market access. Every capital market, every product that ever works is about increasing the market access for customers. So exactly that, if that's what the customer needs, that like cash ETF, then I think it's gonna be, it's going to be a good thing. But because for a, a long time, it was the, the trust, the listed trust that was, I'm not gonna mention the name necessarily, the listed trust that was the access point. That's turned out to not be a successful trade um, going forward. So I think a cash ETF would be better than that. And but it remains to be seen. Have you got any intel on that? You think something's going to happen there soon? 
I, I don't. In fact, I, I was buying Bitcoin uh, late June, early July after the grayscale announcement. You know, so the Bitcoin got hit when the, the SEC said they weren't going to allow it. Um, I think the lawsuit is going to be mission critical for the SEC. I don't see how they can win that lawsuit, because if you read the administrative law in the United States, you can't be arbitrary and capricious about the way you regulate. So you've already allowed for a Bitcoin futures ETF, and there's really not that much difference. Okay, The SEC, I think, is going to lose that case, uh, and Grayscale's bringing it. So in the next 12 to 18 months, I do think you end up with a cash ETF. And of course, we have ETPs in Europe and cash ETFs in Canada. Uh, the reason I'm asking you this, though, is because I see you as one of the visionaries in space. I see your business as uh, one of the cutting edge um, groups in the space. Um, let me phrase a different question. Okay, It's five years from now. It's 2027. Uh, when you and I look at the applications on the Lightning Network, as an example, they're going up exponentially. So where are we in terms of use cases? Where is LMAX in terms of uh, its business in five years as a result of what you and I are seeing, which is despite price volatility, we're seeing exponential growth in applications and exponential growth in development of these uh, cryptocurrencies? Look, you know, I guess I'm a bull. You know, if you look at the wall behind me, you know, the newest, you know, we're sort of, 11, 12-year-old company now. The newest one of those is LMX Digital. It's five years old now. Mm -hmm. Unbelievably, it's it's five years old. And, uh, you know, like if I look back at the number of participants that traded with us in 2018 versus 2022, I mean, you, just, you couldn't imagine it. In fact, the first year and a half of our launch, it doesn't even register in a graph anymore because the numbers are so big. You know, you've got, you know... Um, the biggest month we traded 60 billion, and even in poor, poor months, you're trading 20 billion of this of this asset class. And that's those poor months have been in the in the in the last quarter. You know, we were happy. We were happy at 500 million, a billion back in 2018. So I just expect that to continue and it's going to be driven. Um honestly, I think that the the the, the moment we're looking for is banks really entering the space. And sorry, I'm belaboring that point, but that's, if I look at my other brands behind me, you know, they do 50% of the volume on my exchange, right? They provide 50% of the liquidity on LMAX Global, the broker. It's, they're the one group that's missing. So at the moment, it's brokers and it's uh, all uh, the non-banks or the HFTs. They don't necessarily like that phrase, but that's who's trading in the institutional space. And when, the, when those institutions are there, you know there's a retail market on this wider market access point behind that. I fundamentally believe nothing's changed in terms of bank strategy. And I think if you go and look at all the banks, and certainly there's three things that a bank can do. First thing they can do is invest in it. The second thing they can do is, is trade it. The third thing they can do is, is clear it or be a custodian for it. The truth is at the moment, they're all invested. Not all, but the bulge bracket banks have all invested in blockchain technology and they've all invested in crypto. So they've made the first step. The next one we're looking for it is them trading it and offering trading to their customers. And the third bit is when they say, hey, we're going to bank this thing and we're going to store it. So um, for me, for me, that's in five years' time, you'll say, hey, David. You were pretty smart back then. I don't think I don't think so necessarily. I think everyone who analyzes it, who has those conversations, will realize that this is yeah. an inevitability. And look, I think it's an inevitability. You know, one thing I, I'd like to get across is it's an inevitability for Bitcoin. I think it's probable probable for Ethereum. I cannot speak to nineteen thousand tokens, and. It would be helpful if we actually started to define crypto. Maybe the regulators will do that for us. But when I'm talking about this, for me, every large institution on the street will own, touch, store, structure Bitcoin products five years from now. I mean, it's, I'm, as, I'm as sure as anything I, I've been sure about in capital markets, genuinely. But then people said to me, ah, oh, what about 
XYZ token or Hujima Flip token? No idea. No idea because I need to go and spend a month on each token to understand its utility or its purpose. See, you know, the reason I love having you on, David, is that you have the capital markets experience, you have the insight to where things are going, and you're willing to put your, forgive me for saying it so bluntly, you're willing to put your ass on the line to tell people where it's going, okay? What do you say to the naysayers? Okay, be my therapist for a minute, okay? You're, you're, uh-huh. you're, a, lot, you're a lot cheaper than my therapist, okay? So uh-huh. I have got people like these wirehouses, I won't name the wirehouse because, you know, then they get all upset and inflamed at me, but they put a sell on my fund. The fund goes up 61% in their face. They then put a buy on the fund and we go into crypto winter. It's a diversified fund. So it only goes down about 20%. Now they have a sell on it again. And now of course it's going up. What do you say to people like that? You know, in terms of the, the way they're thinking about this. You, you, you just laid out a case, a visionary case for a long-term five years of a volatile but magnificent trajectory. So what do you say to people that are measuring it minute to minute? Yeah. Use your time horizon. Like every trade you've ever put on into, right? And don't get me wrong. I know it's tough for you. I know it's tough for your investors. I hope like everyone who's, who's in wealth management, for example, they always tell you to take a long-term view. Choose your time horizon. You know, a lot of the time, um, the analysts, the journalists, you know, they need to write about something every day. They need to write about something every, uh, at the end of every month, the end of every quarter. But choose your time horizon. I don't know about you, but I didn't come into this for a six-month trade because you know what? We're not good enough. We're never going to time it. You kidding me? I launched Elmax Digital at the start of 2018, right into a crypto winter. We didn't quit. We didn't quit. And why? I mean, like, who in the right mind would launch then? Well, it's because it, guess what? I can't launch it overnight. It took us six to nine months, and during the six to nine months, you know, there was a massive bull run in, in Bitcoin and crypto. But sure enough, we launched it into the crypto winter. Well, what do you do? Quit because you were wrong. Well. What you think we thought it up just because the price was going up? No, we analyzed blockchain technology. We analyzed the blockchains. We analyzed the use cases of these products. And we went, look, over a, not even a five-year time horizon, over a 10-year time horizon, this or derivative of this has to be exist- in existence in the world, has to be investable in capital markets. And I want to be the exchange, where people were buyers and sellers match. That is no different. So the same thing, look, I think you're gutsy. Um, you know, the, the, the Michael Sailors of the world, that they're gutsy putting everything on the line and, and being so, so all in in a way. I mean, I don't do that. I'm all in. I'm all in in terms of crypto, but I'm all in, not all in in one particular asset. But what I would say is, uh, look, choose your time horizon. Look where this has come from. Again, a 14-year time horizon. You tell me Bitcoin wasn't a good idea. I'm telling you it was a fabulous idea. And I wasn't clever enough to invest in it, to buy it 14 years ago. I want I'm you to react. Sure. Go on. Oh, no. I want you to react to this. Can you see this? Yeah. Okay. That is me caricatured. Of course, they've got me in like a little dwarf's, uh, you know, I mean, I am short, but I don't think I'm that short. But there <laughs> I am. I'm, I'm sinking. In the SS Mooch, I wish I had that much Bitcoin exposure, by the way, and I'm sinking. Okay. And that was in the tabloids at the bottom. Okay. Yeah. Ridiculing me as a traditional finance person, 33 years in the business with my Bitcoin exposure. Okay. So, so what would you say? Be my investor relations person. Now, what would you say to my clients who now see this in the paper and say, okay, Anthony's an imbecile? Okay, and he's going down with the ship. Okay, so you're now my investor relations person, David. What would you say? Well, first and foremost, there's only one thing than them talking about you, and you know that, and that's them not talking about you. Right? <laughs> it's a lot better than being in the White House, Mercer. I can tell you Correct. that. Totally fine. Right. Correct, but that's all right. That was only that was only eleven days. This is only eleven months or something. Right. Right? So, right. well, I appreciate you getting the days right. Some people say ten. 
and it hurts <laughs> my feeling. But I appreciate you getting the days. <laughs> um, look, and I, I'd say again, you just you said to me, you told me something about yourself. You said thirty three years. I'm guessing they invested in your fund because of what you learned over thirty three years. I'm guessing they didn't invest in your fund because of what they saw over 33 days, right, when the price was ramping. So, again, I'm going to say, are you going to judge uh, the individual, you're going to judge the, the fund manager on the last 33 days or the 33 years? We're going to back test it, right? And the truth of the matter is, I don't think any fund investor ever looks at a time horizon shorter than three years. Frankly, if they do, they shouldn't be a fund investor. Yeah, they're in the wrong product. But I tell people that, you know, I mean, they, 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 they're in the wrong product. I mean, we've got guys that are buy, sells, buy, sell. Guys, what are you doing? I mean, just sit tight, you know. I want to I ask you a different question, okay, because you, you have insight into all this stuff. Um, there are 73, according to um, the Blockchain Association, which is a lobbying organization here in the United States, there are 73 million cryptocurrency owners in the United States. Now, I don't know what the numbers are globally. Maybe you know that number. But I think that bodes well in the Western democracies for regulation, because I don't see how these politicians, what are they going to do? They're going to they're gonna go against these, these voting constituencies. What do, what do you think happens to regulation in the United Kingdom, the United States, Western Europe? Well, two different um, two different approaches, right? If it is 73 million, what's that? About 20, 25% of the US population? That's Correct. pretty good. That's pretty good um, for now. But it's a bit like, um, I, think the, I think the last time I looked, there are 6 billion bank accounts in the world by, on account of the, might, maybe it should be more like 10 billion, but um, on account of the number of people in the world. But there's only something like, it might not even be 100 million, it might be 40 million Bitcoin addresses. Okay, that tells you we've got a long way to go, but there's a lot more um, penetration. But what I would say is, regulation is a good thing. Why? Those 70, the, the vast majority of those 73 million people are moms and pops. They're what we call retail investors. They deserve protection. It's the same in the UK. So let's look at it at that a little bit more. In the United Kingdom, anybody over the age of 18 can open an account and trade leveraged products. You can trade leveraged stocks. You can trade leveraged FX, leveraged metals. On things like foreign exchange, you can leverage 100 times. On stocks, you can leverage 30 times. Now, in the United States, the SEC said, you can't do that. And it wasn't that they just wanted to say no. They just said, no, it's risky. So we're going to protect retail investors. So only eligible counterparties or high net worth counterparties can make. Now, you can argue that. Who's got it right, the UK or the US? I would obviously argue more for the UK and Europe because what we do is we have to explain the product to customers. There's a suitability test, i.e., have you used it before? Do you understand leverage? Blah, blah, blah. And then you allow people access. I, d I think not allowing people access is a bad thing. So now you've got 73 million people with access. You can't ban it. Like you've said that to your point, you cannot ban it. So let's regulate it properly and let's protect them. For example, you know, SEC regulated broker, make sure you trade with one of them. Make sure they tell you about the risks. Make sure they show you the downside. Make sure they show you the charts or a magazine with you on the front of it. Make sure they understand what can happen. You know, in the United Kingdom, there's a risk warning that says, on leverage, you know, you can lose more than you, uh, than you first invested. Not a lot of people realize that. So let's protect them. So understand the risks. Only trade with the regulated counterparty. Don't go offshore and don't invest more than you can afford to lose. That's a good thing. So I think that's where it's going. And I make you right. The fact that 73 million people need, means that they can't just delete it, right? And they've got to find a box to put it. Now, whilst you mentioned regulation, 
my personal belief is we have boxes to put it already. Just choose one, right? Choose what these products are. Um, for me, for me, Bitcoin's a currency, by the way. Everyone disagrees. You know, they're going to make it a commodity. I'm not quite sure where it's a commodity. I think it's a currency, but it's fine. Regulate it as a commodity and we're done, right? We understand the rules of the game. Ethereum, everything else, probably securities, every token security, regulate as securities. Then let's follow that law, follow those regulatory frameworks, and ergo, you have the protection for retail investors, right, for consumers that you require, and you have a framework which allows the institutions to invest, to trade with like-minded participants. So I think that's where it's going. In the United States, is leading the definition of these assets right now. Um, I'm really indifferent as to which regulator wins at the arbitrator, what do they call it, the allocations committee. Um, personally, my personal belief is that the SEC, the CFTC, and the Fed will all have a part to play in future regulation, depending on what the institution does for a living. Okay, I think it's very well said. Before I let you go, let's have a little bit of fun, okay? Uh, is uh, Do you want Elon Musk to buy Manchester United? I hope so, because I'm a Liverpool fan, and it'll destroy it even more. <laughs> I knew I was going to get some kind of sports reaction from you. Uh, okay. I mean, look, uh, I think uh, there's nothing wrong. As a Liverpool fan, I think there's nothing wrong with Manchester United right now. You know, we love what the Glazers have done to Manchester United. Love it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's obvious. Okay. I don't think he's buying it, but let me ask you this. Okay. Before you go, uh, does it really matter what fed policy is for the cryptocurrency markets? Meaning the day-to-day -day management of the central bank of England or the central bank of the United States, does it really matter? No, I generally don't think so. I okay, don't I don't, I don't, I don't either, David. But I want you to explain to people before you go why it doesn't matter, because people well, are so Fed centric. They're so managing their markets and the portfolio pursuant to the whims of the Fed, the inflation data yesterday, blah blah. It has a okay. It has an effect on every market, but for me, I just look at you know how do you split your portfolio? How do you manage that? Right, so. Um, Interest rates, interest rates go up. What's the effect going to be on stocks, on commodities? We end up in a risk-off environment. Okay, Bitcoin, crypto is part of that right now. So a lot of this dump is nothing to do with crypto right now. It's to do with three things. Rates, Russia, recession, right? right. Somebody brighter than me was going to say, this, it's this much of the price. I'm going to guess at least 50% of the sell-off of crypto, maybe more, is due to those three things. So, look, there's an impact on what they do, but I've never thought, you know, don't, we, we shouldn't be evangelists. We shouldn't sit there and say, yeah, Bitcoin's an inflation hedge. It clearly isn't an inflation hedge, right, when we're in a risk-off world, right? It clearly isn't. It can be as it becomes less volatile, as it becomes more a store of value. But, you know, let's not, let's not pretend that the Fed or the Bank of England are making, having a large impact on the strategy of asset managers and pension funds out there with regards to crypto. They're having an effect on how they balance their portfolio and the risk appetite of the various funds and their various customers. That's all. It's no different for crypto than it is for a stock portfolio. I think it's uh, really, really well said. I'm going to leave it there with you. You are a tremendous visionary, David Mercer from the LMAX Group. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. And uh, thank you for joining us on Salt Talks today. I look forward to seeing you at your show in New York City. Thank you again to David Mercer for joining us today on Salt Talks. And thank you to everybody who tuned in to today's talk. Just a reminder, if you missed any part of this episode or any of our previous episodes, you can access them all on demand on our website at salt.org backslash talks, on our YouTube channel, which is called Salt Tube, or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. We're also on social media. Twitter is where we are most active. We also live stream our episodes on Twitter at Salt Conference, but we're also on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. And we always appreciate when you spread the word about Salt Talks. On behalf of Anthony and the entire SALT team, this is John Darcy signing off again today. 
We hope to see you back here again soon.